Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We meet in Christ's name. Let us share his peace. To our God, who will richly pardon. I confess my transgressions to you, Lord. Then you forgive me the guilt of my sin. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven. whose sin is put away. I acknowledge my sin to you. And do not conceal my guilt. All the faithful make their prayers. shall not reach them. May the Lord forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, who has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song we will praise our God. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, with God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen.
In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me, for you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of mine enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant, and in your loving kindness save me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the first letter of Peter. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture See, I am laying in Zion a stone a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Those of you who saw the service on Sunday will know that we had a lot of technical problems. And as a result, I spent a lot of hours editing the service and trying to get it into a, a form to put up here on YouTube. When it came to the sermon, uh, it was totally unsalvageable. The sermon itself was a really difficult experience in terms of preaching it. I uh, was sat there and was trying to talk and every so often a message would come up in chat saying can't hear you, saying it's not working, uh, or Becky would come through and wave her arms in the background behind the screen telling me that nothing was working at all and all the while I was trying to keep going the result was that I repeated myself over and over and over again as I had false start after false start. Normally when I preach, I like to move around, so I'm doing that now. And I also like to engage with people. I like to be able to make eye contact and read body language. And sometimes it's not just the things that I say, sometimes it's the pauses as well. And you can do that when you're with a congregation, when you're there in front of people, you're making eye contact, the pauses give the, the space for the next thought, uh, the next move in the sermon so that you can deliver it but when you've got a computer that isn't working properly and lots of people looking at you willing you on a bit like the kind of thing i'd have seen at a school sports day when everyone is just desperately hoping that child who's coming last in the sack race and keeps falling over will make it to the end and so they can give a big cheer when that's your experience of looking at people then you daren't leave too many pauses because if you pause then everyone's just going to think that the screen's frozen yet again when I tried to record myself re-saying the sermon that I'd written and tried to deliver, I found that very difficult as well because there was no energy there, no dynamism at all. Uh, I sat there and I was trying to inject a bit of life 
um, into the sermon, but it just felt very, very flat to me and very, very difficult to do. I'm going to show you now the, the first part of the sermon that I recorded last night. Um, I was sat there in front of the computer, all dressed up in my suit, like I had been on Sunday, um, and was trying to begin that sermon, which begins with a narrative, begins with a story, begins with uh, an illustration which I hope people could relate to. Um, there's nothing wrong with it as such, it just felt such a flat thing to deliver, and it didn't really feel me. It felt like me on 60% or so. And I guess you can do things on 60% and you can try and play it a bit safe sometimes. But as I watched it back, I didn't feel it was right at all. But here it is, here's the start of the sermon, delivered in a similar kind of way to how I delivered the sermon on Sunday. And if everything had gone to plan, this is the kind of thing you'd have heard on Sunday. Let us pray. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the most important places for me in my life is the University of Birmingham. That's where I did my first degree and it's also where I met Becky. In fact, we met on our very first day at the university. It took a couple of years for the course of true love to run smooth, but we did actually meet and remember meeting on our very first day at the university. We were both students in the Faculty of Arts. I studied theology and Becky studied medieval studies. And the Faculty of Arts building was very much a right at the heart of the university. There's a big central uh, quad, big open space, and there to one side is the Faculty of Arts building, maybe a four-storey high building, but very long, with beautiful classical proportions, uh, very thin courses of red bricks, and uh, just by the door, ivy creeping up the wall there. A building that very much looked at home in its surroundings on that big quad and beautifully laid out for campus university. That's where I had my lectures and Becky had her lectures. Well, for me, all apart from one, I studied a, a course in the sociology of religion in my first year. And as a result, I had one course in the next door building, which was called the Muirhead Tower. This was in stark contrast to the Faculty of Arts building. The Muirhead Tower was a kind of brutalist concrete construction, all concrete and glass, a uh, multi-story tower. Um, and when we went up there for our very first lecture, and I think it was maybe the seventh or the eighth floor, uh, we sat there and the lecturer was talking when suddenly we felt a slightly disconcerting movement in our stomachs. And we looked around and it seemed as if the whole building was moving. And the lecturer, without missing a beat, just looked at us and said, oh yeah, yeah, it's designed to move in the wind. That's part of how it was built. So it just sways gently in the wind. You get used to it after a while. We all looked at each other and he said actually it was built here quite a few years ago and they told us only had a 20 year lifespan and it's well past that so it could fall down any day. In fact we're told we're not allowed to open all the windows at once in case that weakens the structural integrity of the building and it does fall down. I don't know if those stories are true or whether it's just what they tell all the first year students but the Muirhead Tower sat there alongside the Faculty of Arts building, a real modern construction, very, very different from the rest of the surroundings. And then next to that, also on the central quad, there was the library, Birmingham University Library. This was huge and it dominated that square. It was a building that spoke of permanence, it spoke of all the generations who'd been before it, and inside the library across multiple floors were stacks and stacks and stacks of books. That's where we had to go to get out the books, to read, to study. There were desks at various intervals. You could sit and study a bit in there, but most of the time we went there, we picked up the books and went home. So you could have got 10 or 12 minutes of me talking like that, but I found it incredibly difficult to record the sermon like that. I got that far. That was after eight attempts, eight takes to get three minutes in. And uh, the chances of me making it all the way to the end non-existent. There was no energy coming back to me and as a result I was finding it very hard to keep the energy going myself. So I decided instead I would take this approach. If you watch the television then you'll never see a talking head in one place with one camera angle for 12 minutes. It just never ever happens. Even the Queen's speech which would have been like that once upon a time, nowadays it cuts away to various shots of the Queen doing the things she's describing in her talk, lots of different images. Um, if you watch a sermon on television, say even Prince Harry's 
uh, marriage to Megan, one of the best preachers in the world, Bishop Curry, preached a very, very dynamic sermon. Uh, everyone remembers both his energy and his sermon, but they also remember the cutaways to the various members of the royal family and other dignitaries and the occasional rolling of eyes at the things he was saying. The directors of that service, uh, in terms of the television, knew that they couldn't just have a talking head for 12 minutes. They had to keep changing the camera angle and showing different things. So I've already retold the story of Birmingham University with which I opened my sermon on Sunday. Becky and I, 30 or so years ago, fresh as new students at Birmingham University, the Arts Faculty Building, the Muirhead Tower, and the, the big university library next to them. Fast forward 30 years. Fast forward to last summer, and Becky and I are in that same university quad, looking up at the clock tower, and standing where we'd have stood as freshers, as new students, all those years before. But this time, we were there for our eldest son Jamie's graduation. And as we looked around the quad, there were things that were reassuringly familiar, and there were also things that were very, very different. The Arts Faculty Building, where Becky and I had had the majority of our lectures, was still there. Ivy was still creeping up it, although it was obvious that it had been cut back a bit. But next to it was the Muirhead Tower, and it looked quite different. The building which we were told was a temporary building, the building which looked the most transient of all the buildings on that campus, had had a kind of upgrade. Some cladding had been added to the exterior. The biggest change of all, though, wasn't to the appearance of the Muirhead Tower. Right next to the Muirhead Tower used to be the University Library, the biggest, the most dominant of the buildings on that quad, the most permanent, the most majestic of the buildings on that quad. And yet, last summer, when we went there and we looked to where the University Library would have been, all we saw was a big green space. The same scene, 30 years apart, three buildings, one pretty much unchanged, one changed to outward appearances, and the other one completely gone. In our epistle reading, St Peter talks about the church as a building. He's not talking about church buildings like St Peter's. Back then, churches didn't have their own dedicated building, they met in houses. So when St Peter describes the church as being like a building and the members of it as being like stones, like living stones, being built up with Christ at the head, he's using a new image, a different way of thinking about church, one which would have been countercultural to the people he was writing to at the time, although to us it seems very, very obvious. But now, in this time of lockdown, when we're not able to get into our church building, we're having to rethink how we are church together, what it means to be church when we can't meet at the building, and what it means to be church and to meet together and to worship when the normal patterns of worship that we follow are the ones which are no longer available to us. And someone like me having to think about what's the best way to communicate a sermon. Peter is describing a conscious building, a selection of stones, a variety of stones, each one different, each one unique, each one then taking its place. As we each look back over our own faith journey, we may think of the people who influenced us, the people who perhaps cared for us and nurtured us spiritually when we were relatively young as Christians, whether that's as children or for some of us as adults. People who spoke, people who knew our names, people who prayed for us, people who taught us, people who encouraged us, people who helped us, people who helped us to find our gifts and to offer them so that we too could be one of those stones being built by Christ into his building, his church. I've said in my magazine article that when we do finally break lockdown, when that comes to an end and we can meet again back at St Peter's and have our worship there, that I think it'd be really important for us to have a period of stability, to not make lots and lots of changes, but for us to be able to return to the familiar. It would take time for that to become familiar again, but it's important for us to have a period of stability, a period when we can just get used to being in public and worshipping together once again. But it's also important that we use this time, this time of lockdown, this time of being forced to have different forms of worship and finding different ways to meet together as church, as a time when we can experiment, 
and think and work together to find new ways to be church. If we think back to Birmingham University and that story I told at the beginning, it's a bit like saying when we get back to St Peter's it needs to be like the arts faculty building. We need to return to the familiar, the things that remind us of what went before, a place that was important to us. But in this time of lockdown we need to make the most of the opportunities we have. We need to see how online worship is different from worshipping in a church building and try and make the most of that. I've tried to use videos in doing that. What we've come up against though is a limitation of technology so I'm going to try and change the way that we deliver the service on a Sunday so we can still have the best of what went before, meeting up via Zoom before the service and then also meeting up via Zoom after the service but also gaining from what we had on Easter Sunday, the stability of a live broadcast on YouTube. So we can meet together on Zoom at about 10.30, then at 10.45 we can go across to YouTube, watch the service, and then at the end of the service we can go back to Zoom and chat and meet again. And we hope too to develop that further. I hope that we'll use uh, one of the features of Zoom, which enables us to meet in smaller groups, to put ourselves into small meeting rooms where people can talk and chat more freely and where lots of different conversations can flow both before and after the service. And we're not doing that to try and put cladding on the outside of a brutalist building which is long past its sell-by date. Instead, it's a bit more like the reason why the University of Birmingham Library that I knew and studied in isn't there anymore, why it's been replaced with a big green open space at the heart of that campus. When I was a student, we went to that university library to study and to take books out. Nowadays, students want a place where they can go with their laptops, where they can access books online, where they can copy and paste sections of text into their essays. They also want meeting spaces. So it needs to be a building with a variety of, of different social areas, quiet areas, areas for books, and areas where people can meet and take breaks. So the university made a big decision to knock down a building that couldn't be rewired with lots of USB points and instead to build a brand new university library and instead to create a big green space at the heart of the campus to facilitate a better way of life for all the students there. When society changes dramatically, big institutions have to also learn to change and to adapt. At the moment, during COVID, we're in lockdown, we can't meet as we usually would and so we need to find new ways to be church and quickly we need to adapt and find the best of those new ways and I hope that in the coming weeks as we make various changes we'll find a way of meeting together and meeting with God on a Sunday morning. And then we need to think about what this means longer term. What does it mean for our church into the future? What can we learn from this time? What skills can we develop? And how do we need to change for the future? We don't quite know what the long-term implications for our society or even for Edinburgh City Centre and the area in which our church is located. We don't know what the long-term implications of the coronavirus are for that, but things will change. We know things have already changed and they will change some more. There will be long familiar figures on the landscape of Edinburgh City Centre which will be no more as a result of this lockdown. And then there'll be other new things flourishing and developing and new ways of people meeting, new ways of people building community. And our church has to be part of that and learn from that and grow into that as well. So I hope that our online worship will reflect those changes and will make the best of the situation we find ourselves in. But more importantly, I hope our online service will reflect who we are as a church and who we are as individuals. I'm going to need to find a way to preach and to lead this worship which is true to me, which is genuine and which means that I can communicate in an honest and a heartfelt manner and not feel stilted and buttoned up and sat behind a table. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. This sermon, delivered in this way, is part of the message. I need to find ways to be me as your leader, even during the coronavirus outbreak and the lockdown. And we as a church also need to find ways, each one of us, to be ourselves and to contribute. Just as the blocks in this wall behind me are all different and all unique. So each member of our church is different and unique. If any one of us thinks that we're not important, it's like taking a block out of the wall. And if you take enough out, it's a bit like a game of Jenga. The whole tower will come tumbling down. We need to find ways in our worship and in our church's life to encourage each other to offer our gifts, 
to be part of the building of Christ Church at St Peter's Lutton Place and in the wider community, to support those who are working during this most difficult of times, to pray for them and to learn from them, and to encourage each other. So my prayer today is that each one of us will find our place within the life and the building of St Peter's. Amen. you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in God the Son? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. 
he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. You believe in God, the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. God, you are our guiding light. Today we find your world a confusing place, full of uncertainty and conflicting advice. It's hard sometimes to know what to think or to do. Some of our concerns include insecurity of employment and fear for the future, loneliness and anxiety in lockdown, fear of the coronavirus and exiting lockdown too early, but also of unmet hopes of a relaxing of restrictions. In Christ, you show us the way. We pray for the guidance that you alone can give us. Grant us patience and understanding, encouragement and love, and guide our decision-making and that of scientists and politicians. This is our prayer. Help, Help us, us to know, know and, and to do, do your well. will. God, you are the source of all wisdom. We have so much to learn and understand about the world around us, about our role in the world, in our families, in St. Peter's, and about discovering a deeper meaning and purpose for our lives. In Christ, you show us the truth. We pray for the wisdom that you alone can give. Give us the wisdom to understand what you would like us to be and to do, and the commitment to do your will. Make us into living stones, a spiritual house in your service, and turn any negativity into hope and possibility. This is our prayer. Help, Help us, us to know, know and, and to do, do your, your will. will. God, you are the giver of life. You have promised us everlasting life if we follow in your ways. We remember this morning Arthur Hopkinson and those who are sick or suffering, those who make sacrifices and take risks to care for the sick. Those who are the unsung heroes working behind the scenes to help ensure medical and social care can be provided. Those who mourn today. And those whose year's mind falls at this time. James Pearson, Molly Natras, Bill Boyd, Emily Langdon, and Reg Botting. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and, and let, let light perpetual, perpetual shine, shine upon, upon them. them. In Christ, you show us the life. We pray for your church, that it may know the eternal life to which it is called. Bless and sustain each one of us in our ministries. Heal us and give us your gift of abundant life. This is our prayer. Help, Help us, us to know, know and do, do your will. 
we make these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life for all the world. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I invite you to say the Lord's Prayer in the form with which you are most comfortable, and Janet will lead us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Generous God, accept the offering of your people for the work of your church through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad. This is the day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light upon our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired Cheered us on our way, sought us and saved us, pardoned and provided. Lord of the years, we bring our thanks today. Lord, for that word, the word of life which fires us.
be with you. Lord bless you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. The grace of our Lord, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit. be with us all. Amen.